Yep. Is it good? Yep. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All righty. So, we are in the second week of uh, catching God's vision for, well, for our church, Commission Church. We're, this is 2022, and this is uh, week one, or Sunday number one of February. Um, and we're, like we talked about last time, we want to see what God sees. So this is not about, hey, we want to see what we see, we do what we think, we'll strategize, we'll put it all together and do what we want. We're saying, no, what does God see? Because that's how we want to see. That's our perspective. And, and so last week, we sort of took this uh, big overview picture of uh, what's the mission of every church, not just our church, but of every church. And we looked at the great mission statement that Jesus gave us at the end of Matthew. You guys remember what that is? Go make disciples. That's right. That's right. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. And it gives us a breakdown of all the nations. You baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always until this is all over with. And we broke that down last week. And there's significant things there. Um, you know, guys, this is the mission for every local church, everywhere on the planet, for all time. So from the moment Jesus instituted that, but then in the uniqueness of the book of Acts, which we're actually going to see today, what he did, what he, he, um, uh, what he said to do, this is the mission for the church, is to make disciples, to build the kingdom, to go after the missing. Remember, it's not about numbers, it's about names. And we are out there going after it, um, finding those names that Jesus lost. And, um, and so that's our mission in a global level. That's the big C mission statement. Our church was named after that mission statement. It's the Great Commission. And what's our church's name? Commission, commission Church. Uh, we figured, we, you know, this thing started. It's like, well, uh, you know, every church has a mission statement. They put on your note cards or whatever, you know, all your paraphernalia. We figured, you know, if this is good enough for Jesus, why don't we just adopt that one? That's our mission statement. But here's the thing. It's, this, it's the same mission for every church. How that is accomplished, however, is going to be different for every local church. So the means to accomplish this mission is going to be different, say, you know, in Brooklyn, New York, the Brooklyn Tabernacle is going to accomplish this a little differently than we are here in Windsor, Colorado. And we're going to accomplish that differently, our means to do it, a little differently than some inner city in China. So that's really what today is about. Um, it's going to be a little shorter today, or actually a lot shorter. And what we're seeing now is God, we're going to go from the big picture now to the, the, the Great Commission, I mean the Commission Church picture. The Great Commission now to this little church. So what does God have for us? And the goal for today is, first of all, let's see from this text that um, will, will be brought to you some of the priorities, some of the things that we're supposed to be devoted to, that our church is supposed to be devoted to, so we see what we're about, um, what, what God wants us to be devoted to, and then we say, well, how are we doing with that? How are we doing with those devotions? And then also, how are we wired? How are we gifted? And that's what we're going to talk about at the end of the day. So I'm about to pray. I'm going to pray that God would speak to us, not just here from the pulpit, but He'd speak to us in our discussion, because there's going to be a lot of it, that we all possess the same Holy Spirit, and God's got a lot to say today. And we're, He's going to set us on the right course for 2022. Okay? So let's, let's bow in prayer. Uh, Father God, thank You so much um, for Your great commission, that mission statement that You gave us, Lord Jesus, and You, you instituted that, and then You... You did some extraordinary things to get the church going, to, 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 to uh, set it on its course, and you haven't stopped since. And Lord, you told us, Jesus, that you're in charge of building your church. And, and so God, we get to partner with you, we get to join in with you, but also with one another. This wonderful thing that you're doing in making disciples uh, and building a kingdom. And Father, I pray that this morning you would speak to us in a very personal way. Because this church, Lord, these people love you. And we want to follow you. And we want to accomplish this goal that you have. We want to do it in a way that you call us to do it. Again, we want to see what you see. We want to desire what you desire. 
So I pray, Lord, not just in the pulpit here. We do, of course, invite you here, Holy Spirit, to speak to us from the pulpit. But, Lord, we want you to speak to us even in our discussion in our groups today and the things that, um, that you have for us all day long. And God, I pray you'd also speak to us through our prayers as we go from this place today. These are things to think about, and I pray that you would really profoundly put on all of our hearts. This is not my church, Lord. This is your church, and it's our church in relationship with you. God, we pray that you would speak to all of our hearts for the direction and guidance for 2022. 2020 and 2021 brought a lot of interesting things, God. But here we are. We want to serve you again this year. So, Lord, we pray that you speak to us as only you can. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. Hey, before we begin, um, that's just something that you have to understand and know, right? You know that this isn't my church. Everybody know that? That's not loud enough, guys. Do you know that? Yes. yes. Okay, and so who does it belong to? Jesus. Jesus. And gang, as we dive into this, this passage here, look, the thing that just jumps out, I've read this thing hundreds of times. And the thing that jumps out at me this week is, we are in this together. It's his church, but vicariously, it's our church. Okay? So we are in this together. And we're going to see what that, the profoundness of that as we, as we dive in. So we're in the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're about to read verses 41 through 47. Before we do, let me just paint the picture for you real quickly. So Jesus gathered those disciples. We read about that last week. He said, go and make disciples. That's your mission. By the way, the Holy Spirit hasn't come upon the believers yet. That hadn't happened because Jesus hadn't left yet. So Jesus leaves, just like he promised. In Acts chapter 1, we see that he says, okay, I, I, I'm going to give you my spirit. And when I do, game on. So they're sitting in the room, about a hundred and something of them. Probably, you know, looking at each other like, what do we do now? And all of a sudden, the room blows up. I mean, not literally. But it's, it's set ablaze. The Spirit comes to the believers. Boom, there it is. Oh, what just so happens is at the same time is this thing called the Feast of the Passover. Pentecost, I mean. Not Passover, Pentecost. That means that there are thousands of Jewish pilgrims, of worshipers, that converge on the city of Jerusalem to do their Jewish religious thing. Thousands of people. Pentecost. And um, so they start speaking in dialects and languages that they shouldn't be speaking. You got this guy here from this hick town over here, and nobody speaks the same language, and all of a sudden they hear these Galileans saying the same things that they do. And they're going, what is going on? So God gets their attention. And then Peter, who not but some 40-something days earlier, couldn't even stand up to the girl at the gate. He denied that he even knew Jesus three different times. He was a coward. That same Peter, now filled with the Spirit, gets on a pulpit in front of thousands of people and says... When he preaches a sermon, at the end of it he says, Hey gang, children of Israel, your Messiah was here, it's Jesus, and you killed him. He didn't care if that meant he was going to die. It's like, this is the gospel. Boom. And as a result, what happened was, many of those people that listened to the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation, heard this message and went, oh, they were literally pierced in the heart and said, what do we do? He said, I'll tell you what you do. You repent. You change your mind about Jesus and about yourself and your sin. Religion's not going to do it. Sin makes you in need of a Savior. That's who you killed, but He's alive. He bled and died for you, and He rose again. Believe in Him. Confess Him as Lord. Believe that He rose from the dead. Believe that He did do what He said He was going to do. Take Him as Savior and Lord. And then be baptized as a result of what God has done in your heart. That outward sign of this newness of life. And you will be saved. And in the beginning of our passage today, it says, verse 41, that 3,000 souls that moment came to saving faith. Can you imagine the baptism ceremony that must have happened after that? I don't know where they got baptized. Some local river or lake or, you know, whatever. 3,000. And there you go. There's the birth of the church. 
we're, we are, um, this is a, you know, you kind of parse this out from this moment on, you know, we're part of the family tree. And this was the start of the family. By the way, this was the church in its purest form. This was the church before denominations. This was the church before church boards had arguments about theolo you know, theology. This was the church before there were seminars and books written on how to do the church. This was the church in the purest sense. They came to faith and then they just did what, they, what you're supposed to do. And it's ironic because you have all of these these worshipers, these religious people that converged upon Jerusalem to do the religious thing, hoping we're going to do our religious thing and then somehow God will be appeased for another year. So hoping that religion can somehow give life, which it doesn't. And then you have 3,000 people experiencing with this other hundred or so that they give, they're given life and then out of that life that they've been given, that outward life stuff happens. The activity starts after salvation, after life is given. It's not the other way around. And so that's what we see. I'm going to read the passage. Listen to this, the activity going on based on the life they were given. Verse 42. That these people were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing them with all as anyone might have the need. Verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I know I've read that to you a couple of million times. We've gone through this before. Because I just, I just love this, because this is, this is the spiritual EKG in operation. This is the, the vital signs of life on display. Eternal life on display. And what we see then is this word devotion. There was a devotion that was going on. I, when it says that, they were continually devoting themselves to these certain things. Let's make sure we understand this, under, this word devotion. Proscor Toreo. Um, this is to abide or adhere. And when you think of the word abide or adhere um, or devote, it's really a perseverance. So when you think of abiding, you think of persevering. And that's, see, think about it this way. Um, the reason why there's so many marriages dissolving in our culture, and, and this has been the way it's been for a long time, is that some, somewhere along the lines, the devotion was not, even though there was vows given to the Lord and to each other on, you know, at some point, there was an understanding that when things get really, really tough, you are still going to persevere through the tough times. I think what we have is this, this and it's not just with marriage, I think it's with any kind of relationship, work, whatever it could be, is that there's not a, a sense of devotion where come Hades or high water, I am not going anywhere. I'm going to persevere. Good times, bad times, I'm sticking with this. It's a, it's a resolve that somewhere in your heart that you decide, this is my devotion. So in other words, this is not, when you see what's going on here, this is not casual relationship. This is not a, um, you know, a casual commitment. These people, because this new light that was in them, were completely and utterly devoted to Jesus. And therefore, they were completely, perseveringly committed to one another. The church today... Maybe we can understand the devoted to Him. We don't so much understand the devotion to one another in that. You know that the Scriptures tell us, 
don't know what that is. The scriptures tell us that if you want not your heart to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, guess what you need? You need each other. You need the church. You need people who love you, who are devoted, and they're going to tell you exactly what you need to hear and encourage you. And you need that every single day of your life. And that's what we see here. This continual, unending devotion. So listen, guys, genuine faith does not give up. It abides. And it's going to go through every twist and every turn that life brings. And again, I think we're quick to say, well, I won't give up on Christ, but then we give up on one another. Uh, what do I do? Should I go knock on the door real hard? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, so, real quickly, let's look at the breakdown. What were they devoted to? They were continually devoting themselves, number one, to the apostles' teaching. Guys, that's the Word of God. Remember, this is before the canonized New Testament. Okay, this is before Paul was even saved. Paul wrote, or penned, 13, at least, 13 of the books of the 27 books of the, of the New Testament. So, this is before the canonized New Testament. So, the Word of God was being preached through the apostles, and they were devoted to it. And I would just suggest also, it wasn't just that they're learning from the apostles only from the pulpit times, okay? They were learning, but they were also, it was a personal devotion. So they were taking this to, to their homes and their places of worship as well. So that's the first one. Next one it says, they were devoted to fellowship. Koinonia. That word is partnership. Partnership. Not just church attendance. But actually, um, they were in collaboration with one another. There was a genuine connection and collaboration. Nobody in this body was saying, I got this on my own. I'm just going to do Jesus my own way. I'm just going to do the, the spiritual thing my own way. No, there was a collaboration, a partnership. And as a result of this, it says at the end there, that there's a gladness and sincerity of heart based on all of the fellowship that was going on. In fact, the fellowship was so deep that um, when people had need, uh, remember, they were coming from all over the known world. And so they're leaving their homes, leaving their workplaces here, coming to Jerusalem. They're part of the body, and they're staying. Well, they don't have a job. They don't have a place to live. Some of them lost relationship with their families because their families are saying, oh, you're going to follow that Jesus guy? You're going to be one of those? Well, you're not part of our family anymore. So they were abandoned. Some of them lost their jobs. They lost their families. And so what happened was, in this partnership, the rest of the body said, hey, we got this. We'll sell our, our property if we have to. But you're going to be okay. Fellowship. Then it says they were continually devoted to the breaking of bread. And this, there's, there's been some debate about what that means. Um, some people say it's communion. Some people say it's just simply breaking bread. It does say it in verse 46, they were breaking bread from house to house, having meals together. I think it really can be either one. And by the way, just as a quick side note, um, communion doesn't just have to happen at church services. Did you know you can have communion in your own homes, by yourself, or with your family, or with your friends? Isn't that a neat idea? You ever try that sometime, just having communion? Anyway. I digress. I think what this is saying, though, is that there is a, the breaking of bread thing, it's not just about the bread and the breaking, it's about the fellowship that is there because they worship Jesus. That's the devotion, is their worship of Jesus. They're worshiping, therefore they have communion. They're worshiping, therefore they're in their, uh, each other's homes. And it says that they have this gladness. They're taking meals together and they're glad. No doubt because finally they can eat pork chops, right? That wasn't funny? Okay. Thank you, Peter. But they're celebrating the Lord. They're worshiping the Lord. That was the reason for the breaking of the bread. And then the final thing was they were devoted to prayer. You know, guys, let's understand that the first church was a praying church. And I'm not just talking about private prayer. Um, there's nothing wrong. In fact, it's so vital that we have our own personal prayer lives, that we go into our prayer closets and pray. What this is saying is they were devoted to corporate prayer. They were devoted 
perseveringly so to praying with one another. And there was a great example of that just two chapters later when Peter and John, they go to the temple and there's Charlie. Charlie's a paralytic, been paralyzed since he was born. And Charlie begs for money and everybody knows him. Oh, that wacky Charlie, there he is. He's begging for money again. One day, Peter and John are going by, and they don't have money for him. They said, you want something else? We've got something else for you. How about in the name of Jesus, walk? And Charlie didn't just walk. He got up and danced. And everybody saw that. And they go, what is going on? And it's in the name of Jesus that he was healed. Everybody knew about it. Well, that caused a ruckus. And the Supreme Court of the religious day, uh, religious people, called Peter and John before them and said, it's now illegal to share the gospel. You will not speak, speak about Jesus any longer. It was illegal to be a Christian. So Peter and John go back to the body. They say, hey gang, guess what? The gospel is illegal now. Being a Christian, it's not good. It's not good with society. What did the body do? Well, they didn't get together and strategize about how they can go underground and share the gospel secretly. They didn't start to come up with ways to compromise. No, they got on their knees together and they cried out to God for more courage and more boldness and more power. And the Lord granted them their prayer. The gospel was more powerful than it had been before. This was a praying church. And guys, as they were devoted to these things, you know, God took care of all the rest. I love this because they had the devotion and they were as a result of the life given to them and their commitment to Jesus and to one another and to these specific things. It says that God gave them favor with the people. So remember the, for those of you who were here last week, at the end of our time, I said, think about that commandment Jesus gave, the new commandment in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so that you, you should love one another. Why? That's how men are going to know you belong to me, that you have love for one another. That's what we see here. There's a genuine commitment and love for one another. And what happened was, they had favor with people outside the church. And as a result, it says that the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. This right here shows us, we, we do what is there, we are devoted to these things, let's let God take care of the numbers. And boy, did He. Now let me say this, um, and this is the closing for now. When I look at this passage, and then I examine our body, I want to tell you something. I see these things. I think we are devoted to these things. But I also think we can grow. I think there's room for improvement, so to speak. But I want you to be encouraged. You know that we have in our body, represented here, several people with every person that is in our body, we have several people that they represent. Many people that you do Bible studies with. Um, some of you are doing those things with people that are out of state. They're not even in the same community or close by. We're seeing uh, people praying with coworkers. Um, we're, we're seeing uh, neighbors, relatives, friends that have been impacted greatly by the tragedies that happen in life. And then somehow they see the body come around that and there's this love and commitment and they're going, what is going on with this? And they're asking the right questions and you're giving the right answers. <coughs> I see it. Guys, I see it. Um, before every service on Sunday morning, what do we do? We pray. And drink coffee and eat sausage, yeah. But we have set aside a time, not just for worship time, not just to sing to the Lord and hear a message, but we, before the message, we gather so we can cry out to the Lord together. And then after the message, what do we do? We, we talk about it and we take it home. We have on our phones an app, an app. and some of you aren't on it, and that's, we gotta get you on there, but we have an app. When there's a prayer request, it goes out, and immediately what happens? Yeah, you get prayed for. I see the devotion to these things and to one another. 
We've helped people pay their light bills. We've helped people with, in terms of uh, physical stuff. I see it. But I also see that we have room to grow. And that's really what I want us now to discuss. You can turn your sheet over now. Okay, grab the sheets. So when you say, what does God's church, or what is God's church? What is God's church? It's these things. It's a teaching slash equipping church. This is a place where believers are equipped. Remember, the goal is not go and make converts. It's go and make what? Disciples, right. So we equip and we teach from the Word of God. Uh, it's a fellowshipping church. We just saw that today. It's a praying church. We just saw that today. It's a worshiping church. That is, worshiping Jesus. Um, it's a serving and sacrificing church. It's a unified church. And ultimately, it's a church that makes disciples. Those are the areas. How many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. There's seven areas right there. Now, here's what I want to discuss, and I'll pray and we'll close and we'll get to it. In your groups, the first question is when you look at this list, how are we doing? How are we doing? And by the way, I know that we're wired, some of us are wired to look at this and go down the list and go, well, here's how we're deficient in all these areas, okay? Let's look at this from the standpoint of, we have a wonderful church body. Thank you, Lord. And these are the things that we see are supposed to happen. And you know what? I do see these things. How do you look at it positively? Not just what the deficits are. But how are we doing? Are we this? And then, once we discuss that for a little while, we're going to now bring, I mean, we're going to then bring up the giftedness and write the giftedness down and see how God has wired us spiritually in terms of spiritual gifts, okay? Let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you, God, for this uh, passage, the, 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 the first church, the birth of the church, God, and what a powerful um, thing we see here, the devotion to these things. Lord, um, you know, Paul was talking to the elders at Ephesus, and he said, Be on guard for yourselves, for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, here it is, which he purchased with his own blood. Lord, we, we have a church, right? We have the church because, Lord Jesus, you spilled your blood for it. You paid the highest price. You, you gave your own life. And so that's what this is all about is ultimately the lifeblood of the church is the blood of Christ, is the life of Christ. So, Lord, we don't want to squander that. We want to be all that we can and should be. Lord, please help us to see what we've got to see going into this year. These areas, Lord, help us to shore up where there's showing up needed. Help us to be encouraged where we're, 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 we're doing well and let that just flourish all the more. God, we want to see the gospel go out from this body and other churches that we're partnered with in this community like never before. God, we want to see souls saved like never before. We want to see people growing in Christ like never before. Times right now require it. The suicide rate of young people is going, it's skyrocketing. The discouragement inside people is going up and up and up. And there's no place to turn in this world. That's where the church comes in. So please, God, help us to be your hands, your feet, your heart to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.